Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Ken Taylor, and I'm one of the cultural producers at the British Library, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event, uh, Gay Liberation Front at 50. Uh, I'm going to hand you over shortly to Stephen Dryden, who's going to be your main presenter today, but I'll, I'll just do a couple of housekeeping things beforehand. Uh, closed captions are available at this event. Uh, if you have a Windows or a Mac system, you should see an options bar near the top of your screen, which should allow you to switch on captions. If you have an Android or iOS device, uh, you'll have to go into your settings and toggle to captions on. You can also adjust uh, your caption settings uh, near the start stop video. If you click on to the button to the side of that, you'll see accessibility and closed caption options. Um, we have the chat function set up so you talk directly to me. So if you have any technical issues, if you couldn't hear a sound clip or, or one of the presenters, drop me a message. I'll do my best to resolve that. But if you have any questions about um, the topic, uh, about what Stephen's presenting about, if you put those into the Q&A box. Uh, we'll cover as many of those as we can. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, we'll have a dedicated Q&A section. Uh, there's nearly 300 of us online at the moment, so we might not be able to answer everyone's questions, uh, but we'll do our best to cover the main points. And uh, do feel free to um, put questions in at any point, uh, even if we address them at the end, because I know it can take uh, a little while to uh, type points. Okay then, uh, I'm going to hand you over to Stephen now, who's going to begin the presentation. Um, so uh, Stephen Dryden is a Humanities and Sound Archive Reference Specialist at the British Library. He co-curated the Gay UK exhibition at the library in 2017 and also creates content for our LGBTQ History's website. Uh, so Stephen, over to you. Hello everyone, thank you very much Ken. Um, it's really nice to be with you all today, if not slightly bizarre, this is the first time that I've ever, ever presented in this format. Um, because it is International Mu Museums Day, just to give you some context about the British Museum, uh, the British Library. We were formerly the printed collection at the British Museum and we became an institution our own right in the 1970s. Um, we've been based at St Pancras since 1996 in one of our physical spaces and we also have an additional storage facility and a reading room at Boston Spa in York. Um, we collect printed material published in the United Kingdom as well as a plethora of other things that you might not know about and I hope that this presentation today might highlight some of those, specifically sound, some political ephemera, um, as well as journals and print newspapers, which might have, uh, you might not have thought that we would have. So I'm going to start trying to share my presentation with you now. Um, technology, technology, <laughs> bear with me. Great. Now, somebody do let me know if there isn't anything on show there. So um, today I'm going to be talking about Gay Liberation Front UK. Um, Gay Liberation Front um, formed in 1970 at the London School of Economics. And in advance of this presentation, I'd just like to shout out and thank Debbie at the uh, LSE, the London School of Economics Library, who has very kindly allowed me to use digitized photographs, which all of you will be able to access via their digital online platform. And there are links that we'll share for that um, throughout the presentation. So every story has a beginning. And the story that I'm going to tell you today starts in the summer of 1970. And specifically uh, with these two gentlemen, Bob Mellers and Aubrey Walter. Um, both Bob and Aubrey went to America in the summer of 1970, um, didn't know each other. One of them ended up on the West Coast, experienced San Francisco and California's gay cultures, and the other was in New York and experienced gay liberation as it was forming post Stonewall um, 69. Um, August um, that, that, that year, that summer of 1970, had been the one year anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising and the first Christopher Street Day Parade, uh, which was a very public show, a public expression of gay liberation. Um, what was also happening in America in the summer of 1970 and the, and the early autumn was the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention. And this was organized by the Black Panther Party and was attended by both Bob and Aubrey, which is where they met. 
And the reason why the, uh, the Revolutionary People's Convention um, became a, a magnet, if you like, for gay liberation in America in the 1970s was because of this letter, um, which was published and sent out to all members of the Black Panther Party and other revolutionary uh, groups. Um, from Huey Newton, who was the leader of the Black Panther Party at the time, and it's you can see their title, a letter from Huey to the revolutionary brothers and sisters about the women's liberation and gay liberation movements. Essentially what Huey was doing was aligning what was happening with uh, the black civil rights movement with both women's liberation and gay liberation. And this was really powerful because it was a founding stone of what would go on to become Gay Liberation UK, which was oppressed groups coming together and working together in order to come um, overcome adversity and change society. So why did people attend Gay Liberation Front? Um, there are two clips here which I'm going to play from the library's um, oral history collection. One is by Mary McIntosh and the other is by Bette Bourne. And this might give you an idea of why people might have uh, encountered or, or gone to a Gay Liberation Front meeting. I went to my first meeting of the Gay Liberation Front in 1970, almost as soon as I heard about it. And we went to what was probably the second meeting upstairs in the LSE. At the time, I thought it was a very curious phenomenon. I, I remember thinking I'd heard of women's liberation but I hadn't heard of gay liberation. But it did ring a bell with me, I suppose. And I was a complete convert to gay liberation from that moment onwards. At that time, I think it probably was a mixed group. I didn't question that at all. There were probably far fewer women. Um, and lots of women didn't stay for various reasons. And that's probably true of lots of men, but I related more to the women. But there were certainly enough of us involved by the, well, by the time we moved into the old lecture theatre at LSE, certainly, uh, for us to feel that there was a group of women um, and that uh, we were very much part of it. And they always insisted that there should be at least one woman on the um, steering group, as it was called, which sort of organised what we were going to talk about. So the meetings uh, developed rapidly and um, as, as it said there they started at the London School of Economics and that was largely thanks to um, working together um, with a lesbian named Bev Jackson who was attending the London School of Economics at the time. Um, the, the meetings grew rapidly, there was over two, three hundred people attending within, within the first few weeks. Um, where on these, uh, on these slides where you see the names of people talking, the, 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 the digits afterwards is actually the British Library shelf mark. So if any of you did want to come into the library and explore oral history, just make a note of some of those and you can, um, you'll have direct references that you can quote to us. I'd met this man in Australia. We, we become lovers and we were living together at the end of this street here. And uh, he went to this meeting with the GLF and came back and I poo-pooed it like mad. Politics. And because uh, actors didn't get involved in politics, then you know everything you say, everything you breathe is political, as far as I'm concerned. So anyway, uh, I, I just poo pooed it, and then he said there was really nice blokes down there. You should come down. And I was down there like a shot. Of course, to me it was another gay bar, but it wasn't. It was people actually talking about issues and get, getting out and onto the streets. And what sort of people at the meeting? Where was the meeting? There was some rather famous directors now at this meeting, theatre directors and theatre stars um, and David Hockney and people like that, had come along for curiosity and I became a regular and I was on the steering committee and all that. But there were mostly students and working class queens. I'd met this man. So the, um, Bet was talking there about meeting, thinking it was a gay bar, going along and becoming in some way kind of politicized. And obviously any political organization and 
Gay Liberation Front wasn't technically an organization, it was a movement of people, a group of, a collective of people who were working together in order to achieve a common aim. And very quickly it became apparent that there had to be a common aim stated, a, a, a way that people could come together and unite a banner. And this is a document from the London School of Economics, which you can find on their um, Flickr account of digitized documents from the Hall Carpenter archive. And this is a, an articulation of the, the, the first principles that were, um, were, which were taken up by the Gay Liberation Front. Um, I want to highlight just a couple of paragraphs from it. So there is this one here, which is the beginning of the document, which is that we believe that apathy and fear are the barriers that imprison people from an incalculable landscape of self-awareness, and that they are the elements of prejudice and the enemies of truth. That every person has the right to develop and extend their character and explore their sexuality through relationships with any other human being without moral, social, or political pressure. So this is very much uh, a social revolution, a social sexual revolution that the, the GLF are starting to articulate from this very first uh, public statement. The last paragraph I think is quite poignant and I think it summarizes the, um, the anger which was within the community at the time at increased levels of policing of the community. Um, following the passing of the Sexual Offences Act in 1967, which partially decriminalised homosexuality in the United, well, in, the, in, in England and Wales, not the United Kingdom. There was a lot of anger within the community still. Um, and this last paragraph, I think, is, is quite articulate in, in maybe the reasons why. In the name of the tens of thousands who wore the badge of homosexuality in the gas chambers and concentration camps, who have no children to remember and whom the, your history forgets, we demand honour, identity, and liberation. And these would become the, the beating drum, if you like, of where and how Gay Liberation Front would organise in the beginning. Obviously the word gay was something that was relatively new to Britain in the 1970s. And there is a clip here from John Chesterman, who was an early um, activist attending Gay Liberation Front meetings. And he articulates um, that word gay and what it meant to him at the time. Uh, the other thing we had to adjust to was suddenly using this word gay because all my life up to that point, we'd call ourselves queer as a sort of joke, another negative word which was turned around uh, to be positive and this was considered terribly incorrect to try to use that word and it was it was agreed that gay should be adopted and all of a sudden that's what we called ourselves i don't think anybody had really used that term in this country before the origins of the glf so in this instance the word gay means any sexual or gender minority who was oppressed by society. So women were gay women, uh, men were gay men, and it was only later that language would develop and people would become politically aware enough to begin assigning um, or, or, or coming together under different words. So the term lesbian became prominent amongst gay women from the Gay Liberation Front. Um, indeed, terms like bisexual, um, men having sex with men, um, transsexual would all be begin to start brewing within this melting pot of gay liberation and the political ideas that were there. This badge itself is from the, um, the Hall Carpenter Collection at, at, at London School of Economics. And the reason why I include this here is this is a really important way in which gay liberation put into action one of their beliefs that everybody should come out that everybody should be visible. And the idea was that members of the public who saw you on the tube or walking in the street could see the badge and perhaps ask you, what does that mean? Um, I'm gonna play a clip now from Nettie Poll of Nettie Pollard talking about wearing the badge within her activism. And you, you mentioned the train routine, um, that was quite important. I mean, that was something that we were doing very openly as lesbian people. I mean, I wore um, for quite a few years actually, I wore a Gay Liberation Front badge all the time. So, I mean, you met ordinary people who, you know, would never have, you know, hadn't met people like us before at all. Um, but we did it sort of completely openly as being gay. And it was very interesting, actually, just how little hostility one one came across. I mean, what, just what kind of work did you do within the claimants union? Well, it was trying to get people the benefits that they were entitled to. And it was um, also quite often dealing with their housing situations and helping families to do squatting that kind of thing and trying to get them get them rehoused 
um, it was amazing how many lesbians we managed, we, we actually met who were people who would never have had anything to do with GLF particularly. But I mean, I remember particularly a woman who had about eight or nine children and um, she, 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 you know, she, she was married and, and everything and she would say things like, you know, well, I mean, you know, I was like, I was like you when I, when I was your age, but of course, I mean, you know, I had to get married in the end, didn't I? You know, and I mean, this is not somebody, who, you know, that would, would have identified as a lesbian at all. So we can see that this visibility, this talking about homosexuality was part of um, what gay liberation did extremely well, which was consciousness raising. And this was an idea which came very much from um, the, um, uh, the, the Black Panthers and um, the civil rights movement, that people had to understand the means and ways in which they were uh, oppressed or suppressed by society. The Gay Liberation Front's um, ideas, political ideas, uh, grew rapidly and, and expanded. In, in November 1970, we step away from the principles and we begin to get this articulation of demands. We demand from society. Um, there were eight demands from the Gay Liberation Front which were published, and, um, and, and here, are, here they are. Um, I think looking through them, there are a few which are still extremely pertinent today. So looking at them, the sex education in schools stop being exclusively heterosexual. Um, one only has to think about the protests which happened in Birmingham uh, last year to think about how education has changed and how education is changing in order to talk about everybody in society. Um, others which um, to me strikers particularly poignant are, um, is the final one which is that gay people should be free to kiss and hold hands in public as a, as a heterosexuals. Um, here's Mary McIntosh talking about the, uh, um, the making of the demands. The first thing that we did in the Gay Liberation Front, probably the certainly in the second meeting, was discuss what should be uh, uh, demands. Each of them I remember being debated. Particularly, I, I s remember the demand for holding hands in public, our right to hold hands in public. Some people said it was quite trivial and, you know, not nearly as important as, as the other ones. And some people said it was vitally important and, and we needed that right in order to show um, that there was nothing wrong with being gay. And we, we didn't at that time have slogans like glad to be gay and gay power and so forth. So we did have to fight our way towards that, I think. So to me, these demands are still very powerful, especially when we start thinking of, about them in a global context, where there are still countries where people aren't free to be who they want to be. And I think also if we broaden this out and don't just think about gay people, which is how we were articulating ourselves in the 1970s, but think more broadly about the LGBTQ plus community and where these demands perhaps stand for us as a community. Um, and of course, gay is good, all power to the oppressed people. These were new and revolutionary ideas in the 1970s and a really articulate way in which people could organize. Gay people were also interested in talking to other gay people and the Gay Liberation Front were um, quickly expanding their ideas to the point of a manifesto. This was created by the Manifesto Group, which is a subgroup within the Gay Liberation Front. And activists would meet, discuss, often argue, and formulate the Gay Liberation Front's manifesto. I'm showing you now a picture of the introduction page. So these are the first two paragraphs which a gay person would see when they were picking up a copy of the Gay Liberation Front Manifesto. And to me, it's extremely powerful in describing what it is that this person is about to encounter when they open this document. To you, our gay brothers and sisters, we say that you were oppressed. We intend to show you examples of the hatred and fear with which straight society regulates us to the position and treatment of subhumans and to explain this basis. We will show you how we can use our righteous anger to uproot the oppressive system with its decaying and constricting ideology and how we, 
together with other oppressed groups, can start to form a new order and a liberated lifestyle from the alternatives which we offer. The document then goes on to explain how and why gay people are oppressed and also why they should come together and why they should organize. It's extremely powerful in the 1970s when there was little representation, there was no internet. If we think of a time when you would literally have to go and find a document, a piece of paper in order to find out about yourself, to chew at anything about yourself. This document acted as a beacon. It was talismanic almost, and acted as a gateway in which people could find their own community. The first uh, demonstration by uh, the Gay Liberation Front was actually at Highbury Fields, and that was 150 members of the GLF holding torches and holding a rally against police harassment. Accounts of this are, are, are present in the British Library's archive, specifically in oral histories, and I'd be very happy to, to, to chat with people about those. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was Come Together, and Come Together is the, the newspaper, the journal of the Gay Liberation Front, which was produced ad, ad hoc almost, but it was a regular publication. And this issue, issue number eight, actually coincides with the uh, Age of Consent March, which was the first public protest demonstration march through the center of London by uh, a gay organization. It was organized by the youth group and was to highlight the discrepancy between the Age of Consent for homosexuals and heterosexuals. So the 1967 Sexual Offences Act legalized um, same-sex activity between men over the age of 21 in private, only two of them, no threesomes, and you had to be in England or Wales. These laws did not apply in Scotland or Northern Ireland. The youth group were highlighting the discrepancy both within England and Wales for the age of consent. Straight people were 16, gay people had to be 21, but also highlighting the fact that Northern Ireland and Scotland still did not have equal age of consent. It was still criminal, homosexuality was still criminal in Scotland and Northern Ireland. In September 1971, we have possibly one of the best known um, demonstrations which was held by the Gay Liberation Front. And it was um, targeted at this organization, the Festival of Light. Um, in the center there, you can see a young Cliff Richard. And he's also there lighting a prayer beacon as well. Um, and he's with Mary Whitehouse. Mary Whitehouse might be um, known to some of you um, if you were around in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Mary Whitehouse led an organization called the Listeners and National Listeners and Viewers Association and was also a figurehead of the Festival of Light, which campaigned to government against what they saw as moral evils. And these moral evils included extramarital sex, pornography, abortion, sex in TV and films, and obviously homosexuals, uh, the, the gay rights movement, which was extremely vocal at this point following the passing of the 1967 legislation. The actual protest itself was known as Operation Rupert, and there are a few accounts of this within oral histories at the British Library. Um, I think specifically of an interview with Michael James, who was involved in the, in, in the protest. Um, I haven't cut and edited any of the oral history into this presentation because it takes a lot of work to try and condense exactly what actually happened in the Methodist Hall, Central Hall in Westminster on the 9th of September 1971. But in a nutshell, I can summarize it like this. Um, Members of Gay Liberation Front formed small groups who decided upon an action that they would take once they were inside the Methodist Central Hall in Westminster, where the Festival of Light was holding a rally. Each group was told what the action was preceding their action, and they would start their action when that finished. The crowd had settled and the person had been ejected from the, from the hall. Actions on the day included uh, kiss-ins by members of the youth group, mice being released into the auditorium, there were lesbian couples standing, holding each other, showing affection and kissing. All of a sudden nuns appeared, a group of nuns who were actually members of the radical uh, drag theatre uh, group, which was part of GLF, um, street theatre. Um, there was a bishop, 
a very theatrical Betty Bourne, who we heard earlier, who was a classically trained actor, stood up and proclaimed that they could feel evil in this place. After each act, the person would have to be physically removed from the hall and the crowd calmed before the rally could continue. And just as it settled, another action would begin. It completely disrupted the, uh, the event of the rally and gained widespread national press. This issue of Come Together um, actually articulates uh, an attempt by Gay Liberation Front to join a different demonstration a few weeks later. Um, the photograph here is of Stuart Feather conducting the GLF choir. And the GLF were keen to, to join the march with um, the Festival of Light in, in solidarity, um, mock solidarity, obviously. There is a photograph here, um, again, from the London School of Economics collection where um, activists were being arrested. This is Stuart Feather and Nicholas Bramble as the spirit of porn. What's interesting about this, uh, this issue of Come Together, number 10, is that it shows um, Rupert, Rupert Bear, trying to join uh, a march with other woodland creatures. And what this does is it really links Gay Liberation Front to the um, political activity and the counterculture that was going on at the time. So as this was happening, Oz Magazine released its kids issue, which um, the editors were taken to court for, for, uh, for, for, for corrupting minors. The, the school children had included a rather obscene cartoon of Rupert the Bear. And the, uh, the court case was a, was a revolution in the counterculture. John Lennon um, was there and gave evidence, as did Marty Feldman, the comedian. You can also hear, see here on this slide a copy of Inc. Magazine, which is a radical underground press publication, and its cover from December 1971, in which they show a lipstick and eye-shadowed clad Che Guevara with just the term gay exclamation part, uh, point. Communes were also a big part of the Gay Liberation Front and people coming together and finding new ways of living and being. Um, this issue of Come Together, which is held in the British Library's collection, um, is the Notting Hill issue. And there was a very well-known Gay Liberation Front commune based there. And you can see some of the members in the wonderful photograph, which was shared with me by Stuart Feather. On the actual publication itself, this folds out into an A2 size page. And there is a black and white photograph, or a copy of this photograph. But this is, this is an original that's been put together by Stuart. Um, the communes themselves were really um, interesting because that was where people were um, putting money in pots, sharing wardrobes and clothes, experimenting with dress and drugs, very much part of the counterculture which was already going on in London. Um, indeed, the ideas which were, exp which were played with within uh, the communes would perhaps best be articulated um, years later by Larry Mitchell in his book Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions, which was published, published in America, in which he said that there is more to be learned from wearing a dress for a day than there is from wearing a suit for a lifetime. The communes very much sought to break down gender roles, which was a key component of the GLF manifesto, which viewed the nuclear family and the almost forcing of women to marry in order to acquire any kind of independence from their family as oppressive within itself. And the communes did an awful lot um, to, to generate these discussions around gender and uh, with and alongside sexuality. And this is a clipping from inside this issue of Come Together, which was published in 1973. And this includes photographs from the first Gay Pride March, which happened in London in 1972, which was known as Gay Pride Day. And in the top there, you can see that there is an all men come out and do it, um, in which um, it says one thing I think I now see clearly is that these, um, these attacks on queens so vigorously from the ones who most want, are, are from the ones who most want to get into drag. Essentially, this is um, the radical communes articulating why they think um, straight gays, as they would have termed them, so, um, people who just wanted to blend in to get on with their lives, perhaps they should in turn take on um, some of this gender play drag um, and try to understand what gender was within the society which we were forced to participate in. 
gay pride was a huge thing that was started by the Gay Liberation Front. The first gay pride march was held in, on the 1st of July 1972. There were over 2,000 participants and like this photograph which is from a later pride you can see that the police rather than marching with pride are actually policing it. Um, these first pride demonstrations which were very much protests um, were done without anybody knowing how crowds would react. We're, we we're very familiar now with, um, with gay pride being a celebration, something which brands and large national organizations, indeed instruments of government, um, participate in. But that wasn't always the case. And it was very much the revolutionary um, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people which formed the core of Gay Liberation Front who started that first march in 1972, who founded Pride and, and what it was. There's some more photographs there of various gay prides. All of these are available on the London School of Economics digitized image pages. You can see there in the bottom screen there is a, a, a banner for the campaign for homosexual equality. This was the group which very much picked up and was fighting for legal legislative change for, for gay people um, since the 1967 legislation, but certainly after Gay Liberation Front disbanded in late 1973, early 1974, they certainly picked up the banner and led and organized um, gay pride marches from, from then on. The relationship of women to Gay Liberation Front is something which you encounter quite a lot in oral histories in the British Library's collections. And it was something which was, the, the male chauvinism was something which was talked about an awful lot in Gay Liberation Front. So we can see here an, an issue of come together from uh, is, issue number three, um, which the subject of is Gay Liberation Front and male chauvinism. I'm going to play a clip now from Mary McIntosh, which articulates how women were forming their own consciousness and their own identities within the Gay Liberation Front and where they were meeting with the women's liberation movement, specifically at the Women's Liberation Movement Conference in Skegness. Um, and I'm going to play that clip for you now. Rosalind Delmar came along to some GLF meetings and persuaded a group of us women to go to the Skegness Conference, the National Conference of Women women's liberation movement and we went a group of us in a minibus we formed very much a, a group of people who all knew each other and uh, we sat in a row I remember people on the platform including men on the platform and then a row of us um, and a lot of other women in the uh, body of the hall a women's liberation movement which had started as a a non-sectarian movement and defended its non-sectarianism quite, quite strongly against, well, at that time, the um, socialist workers, the Communist Party, the various um, uh, groups. There was a threat that they would be taken over by a group of Maoists. My memory is of, um, as she was then called, Mary O'Shea, standing up with her, she had long blonde hair at that time, and proclaiming uh, that they were wrong and that we had the right to be women and be non-aligned and so forth. And she was very dramatic. Uh, we basically stormed the platform. We made sure that one of the, ma the male Maoists, that he was ejected from the hall and actually the um, male security guards at uh, that conference centre did lead him away. And we just talked about women's right to be self-organising. But basically we stormed the platform and took over the conference. And from then on, the conference was run as a women's conference, very much like future women's liberation conferences, I think. So we see that from 1971, the Women of Gay Liberation Front were meeting and organizing with the, women liber the Women's Liberation Movement. Um, this would form um, almost 
a, a rift within gay liberation front um, between um, gay men and lesbians. And it would be part of the reason that many activists would view gay liberation front as having ended once the women had decided that they were no longer going to be part of the organization. Um, women did stay, but the, um, the politicized um, or the political movement of women from Gay Liberation Front really did move more towards uh, the women's liberation movement and indeed were responsible for men being um, removed from the platform at women, women's liberation conferences and in subsequent years would also um, have lesbianism added to the demands for the women's liberation movement. Rosalind. The, the counter-psychiatry group was also a group which formed in Gay Liberation Front, and this was very important for um, people understanding um, their own oppression by society, but also helping to inform psychiatry about homosexuality and aiming towards one of the demands, which was that um, homosexuality stopped being treated as a sickness, um, that it stopped being tried um, uh, treatments stop being made by psychiatrists in order to cure people of homosexuality. Um, um, this Gay Liberation Front pamphlet, um, number seven, is part of the British Library's holdings, and alongside that, the um, With Downcast Gaze, which was published in 1974 after Gay Liberation Front disbanded, but was very much formed by um, members of the Gay Liberation Front or activists within Gay Liberation Front. I'm very conscious of using, using the term member uh, in relation to Gay Liberation Front because it wasn't an organization in, in, that, in that respect. Another um, publication which came out which was extremely important for the community at this time was Gay News, um, Britain's first gay newspaper. Um, this was um, first published in 1972 for the very first Gay Pride March, an issue of Gay News was released. The publication would go on um, printing until 1983, and it was where the community could come share news, um, stories which were relevant to them. You can see on some of the issues here are a few things that people would have been interested at the time. So um, Gay Pride March in 79 and its growing um, uh, notoriety within, within mainstream national press. On I'm hoping that this is your far right, but I'm not sure. Um, you've got Scots Anger, Gay News. So this is obviously where um, Scotland still did not have age of consent um, equality. Um, uh, and the, the ongoing political situation within the United Kingdom and in the center there about queer bashing, which was rife. Um, you know, um, it's interesting that yesterday was um, International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Triphobia, and um, Transphobia, sorry. Um, and uh, this has always been an issue within the community and often it is um, being brutalized um, and treated badly in society, which, for, which, 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 which had people coming towards Gay Liberation Front to help them understand that there was nothing wrong with them, that the way society was treating them um, was down to education, visibility, and people knowing um, that gay people were just the same as everybody else, had the same concerns, the same worries, uh, the same hopes in, in many instances as well. Gay Liberation Front also spread throughout the United Kingdom and the library has a few examples of um, Gay Liberation Front um, leaflets and uh, pamphlets that were, were produced in the region. So here we can see um, Gay Liberation Front from Bradford, um, the front issue there about the National Front. This was produced in May 1976. So even though the, the main organization of Gay Liberation Front London had disbanded in early 74, um, out in the regions, Gay Liberation the idea, the notions of gay liberation, the manifesto, was still the rallying call and the thing which people were, were going to in order to start consciousness raising, to understand themselves and their place in society. In the sense of their Gay Flashes, which is a publication from Leeds, and on the far right, Glad Rags from Birmingham Gay Liberation Front, produced in 1976. 
One um, organization which came out of Gay Liberation Front, and I'm just checking the time, um, was uh, Gay Icebreakers and Lesbian and Gay Switchboard. Um, this was a really important um, organization for people to find out more about homosexuality and themselves and have somebody to talk to. I'm going to play very briefly this clip by Zaid Dar, who wasn't in Gay Liberation Front, which was, but is very much one of these people who benefited from the work that Gay Liberation Front had done in setting up organizations like Gay Switchboard, Icebreakers, and, um, and Gay News. There used to be an ad in Time Out about Gay Icebreakers. So for weeks and weeks, I used to buy this, and I always used to turn to this ad, and eventually I was alone one Saturday night, and I phoned, I phoned the number, I phoned Icebreakers. But when the first time I phoned, I couldn't say a word. I was so scared at the thought that I was phoning something that was gay, you know. And I remember that whoever it was who answered made me feel so good, you know. He knew exactly what, what I was going through, you know. He said, you don't have to say anything, right? He, and he just talked and talked and talked, and eventually, I I, I came out with it. I, but I didn't say I was gay. I, I said, "Oh, I think I might be bisexual." You see, from from there, it was just you know he just carried on talking to me. And I rang a few times then. I used to, but I remember I I could only ring when everyone was out, and I was positive there was no one in. After that, going through icebreakers, going to their discos, then going to tea parties on Sunday afternoons, um, talking about sexual politics, uh, politics in general, uh, I, I became more politicised and I met uh, another gay Asian at an icebreakers tea party and we became uh, very good friends and uh, I've known him ever since. And I haven't looked back, really. So with that sentiment of, of never looking back, um, Gay Liberation Front um, was founded 50 years ago this year in October. These are some of the um, surviving Gay Liberation Front activists. And this was from a photo call that they did in uh, last year. Um, at Trafalgar Square, where you've seen images of earlier on in my presentation. Um, Gay Liberation Front, um, to celebrate their 50th birthday party, uh, their 50th anniversary, birthday party, anniversary, um, have been meeting again at the London School of Economics for the last 18 months. Consciousness raising, talking about issues within the community. And there will be, as far as I understand, um, some events happening later on this year, obviously situation dependent and, and how things go with us to keep us all safe. But it would definitely be worth, if you are interested in seeing what is happening or finding out more about Gay Liberation Front, to, to, to seek them out online. I would strongly encourage that. Um, there are a few resources here which I think Ken would have shared with you throughout the presentation, which I think further reading, I'm, um, uh, there, there, there are other accounts by activists who were actually there which are worth checking out and there are also a few links. Um, Ken, are there any questions that you think we should go with? Uh, just coming on, Stephen. Yeah, there's a, a few questions come in. Uh, do encourage people to send a few more in. I think uh, we're getting a few in now. Uh, one is a question from Maisie. Um, do you know, are there many links between the role of GLF and LGSM? Uh, lesbian and Gay Support the Minors, LGSM. Um, there were through, um, I think, mostly gay left, um, but they were they were much later i, I believe um lgsm lesbians and gays support the minders minors formed in the early 80s and gay liberation front had disbanded within you know 1974 kind of the last estimate um but certainly the tactics and the strategies for which uh, gay liberation front were doing i'm sure there would have been some influence but i couldn't really comment on on direct links i'm afraid um, uh no problem. Um, question from Robert. Um, Stephen, what do you think uh, that today's liberation and justice movements can learn most from the actions of the GLF? Hmm. 
what can they learn most from the Gay Liberation Front? I think, to be honest, the thing that I find most uh, refreshing and um, encouraging about um, the GLF um, is uh, the fun that they seem to have had. Um, the, uh, the camaraderie, the consciousness raising, the discos, the um, zaps and activism that they did. Um, street theatre seems to have been, um, from the accounts that I've read, seems to have been, a, been, been great fun in order to get political messages out into the public eye. Um, so I would strongly suggest reading, um, if you are interested in activism within GLF and how it was done, um, Stuart Feather's book, Blowing, Blowing the Lid, um, it'd be a great thing for you to read. Uh, there's another good question here, because um, obviously uh, we're the British Library, but we have a lot of international viewers to this event. Yeah. Uh, so what were the links with GLF, with organisations outside of the UK? Um, and did the groups influence each other in terms of political actions, tactics, etc.? Uh, yes, certainly. There's um, there's well documented links, especially between um, America and the United Kingdom during this time. Um, I think specifically of um, publications which would have gone backwards and forwards. We have to remember that when we're talking about Gay Liberation Front and the 1970s in general, this is a pre-digital age. So the way that information was exchanged was through the postage of publications, journals, newspapers. So. I think specifically of things like Fagrag, which was a publication which was produced in the 70s in Boston, Massachusetts, which would have come over to the UK and in turn gay news and come together, migrated over to the United States. We had, um, we were at, at an advantage in the UK over America as well, that you have to remember that in America, homosexuality was still illegal. Um, in the United, well, in England and Wales, not the United Kingdom, in England and Wales, homosexuality was partially decriminalized in 1967, and that didn't happen in America for a very long time. Uh, good question from George here. Says, so great event. Thank you, George. Um, and I think it's one of a couple of questions we have looking at uh, placing the GLF in, in wider history. Yeah. So um, how important do you think, Stephen, was the spirit of the GLF uh, in the radical HIV AIDS politics which followed in the 1980s and 90s? Very heavy questions. Um, obviously, HIV and AIDS is the great pandemic from the 20th century, which is still ongoing as we find ourselves in another time of pandemic. Um, I think specifically thinking of actions which GLF undertook, which then um, went into ACT UP and organizations like that, both in America and the UK. Um, there were members of the youth group who would then go on to be extremely vocal in the HIV AIDS campaigning um, world. Um, but that specifically, going into a place and causing a scene, and I mean that in the nicest possible wonderful way, to have direct action which is non-violent but also passes on a political message, I think is definitely something which came through from um, Gay Liberation from specifically thinking about that Methodist Hall demonstration against the Festival of Light. Um, that was adopted and, and utilized very well, especially by the American um, uh, ACT UP movement and, and indeed the UK as well. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if you could elaborate more about the presence and role of trans people in, in the uh, GLF in the 70s. Well, obviously, um, the language of sexuality, of gender and sexuality, was going, undergoing radical change um, throughout the 1970s. We have the women's liberation movement, we have the publishing of um, Jermaine Greer's seminal book, The Female Eunuch, and there are these developing understandings of who and what people could be if they were living their true authentic lives themselves. In terms of trans movements and trans people, I would say that they were welcome within Gay Liberation Front because gay liberation, gay, in the, in the term that we're thinking of it now, didn't just apply to men or men who had sex with men. Um, the, this, these languages, these ideas, these notions and different ways of being were something that was developing throughout Gay Liberation Front. And there was certainly evidence of communes where um, people, 
dressing in clothes not assigned to their gender um, was actually a founding stone of, of that commune or that living situation. So it's hard to say, given how developed and ever changing our language is about gender and gender identity now, to compare that with the lives and the opportunities and the ways that people could articulate, that, articulate their gender identity in the 1970s. Um, there are and continue to be trans activists who were involved in Gay Liberation Front who are out there and in the world. I think specifically of Roz Keevney, who I met at one of the Gay Liberation Front think-ins recently at London School of Economics. Um, so they were certainly present, they were certainly there, um, but the language is something that we must always be uh, conscious and considerate of when we're thinking about these things in historic and current contexts. Okay, thanks, Dean. There's yeah. another good question from Sophie here um, in, in terms of uh, more your day-to-day -day work uh, when you're not doing oh, webinars. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, could you tell us a little bit more about how the library continues to collect items, recordings, documents related to LGBTQ plus uh, rights and issues now? Cool. Yeah, so the library has an active um, collecting policy of um, printed ephemera produced in the United Kingdom. We also, since 2014, have been archiving the World Wide Web, so .co.uk web domains. Um, we have a very active and ever-growing collection of zines, and a lot of those come from the LGBTQ community. Um, in terms of uh, sound recordings and how that collection grows, all of the recordings that I played for you today come from collections from the oral history department at the library. Um, they have ongoing projects which they archive. Um, I also would suggest that you um, check out the British Library's web pages for Unlocking Our Sound Heritage and Save Our Sounds projects. These are nationally funded projects which aim to uh, preserve the nation's audio heritage and make it more accessible. And I hope that in, uh, in the years to, year, 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 year to come, not years, years to come, we will be able to provide more access to our oral histories um, off-site, specifically relating to the LGBTQ community. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, another good sort of question about the wider context. Um, and I think it's something you touched upon, but maybe you could elaborate a bit more. Uh, did the gay liberation activists regard themselves as part of a wider civil rights movement? And they, did they expand to have solidarity with other ethnic, religious, minority communities mm. uh, in the UK? Yeah, absolutely. Um, gay Liberation Front attended uh, marches by Black Panther activists within London. Um, we heard there from the clip uh, featuring Nettie Pollard, that Nettie and other lesbians were involved in the Claimants Union, um, which was helping people to get access to benefits and housing. Um, so yeah, they, the, the coming together of oppressed people is something which uh, this document, the Jay Liberation Front Manifesto, um, certainly um, emphasised all oppressed people needed to come together in order to uh, reform society to to create radical change yeah okay um we've got plenty of questions here so i'm afraid we won't be able to answer <laughs> everyone so uh, but again some really great ones and we will give uh, contact details and things uh, later on uh, so yeah, we might be able to send some links through to you um let me just pick another one let's see Oh yeah, um, so you touched upon Stephen um, LGBTQ rights in Scotland um, yeah. and obviously that the legislation didn't change there as rapidly. Um, could you describe the relationship uh, between the main group and uh, activists in Scotland uh, with the different legal situation? Um, I can't speak specifically to their relationship with Scottish act activists, you know, specifically. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not conscious of that, but I can obviously um, put you in touch with people who might be able to help you. Um, what I can say is that members of the London group, the London Gay Liberation Front, did go out into the regions and actively help set up regional groups to initially form meetings to show people how they did it in London, if you like. Um, there are on the LSE um, digitized images website, which, which you've seen links for hopefully go out on the chat. Um, there are actually images of London Gay Liberation Front activists in, I think it's Bradford, um, helping them organize and show a meeting. Um, I am sure 
that that happened in Scotland also, that lessons were learned by Scottish activists and were taken back to Scotland and used. But I, I, I couldn't speak specifically to the Scottish relationship, I'm afraid. No problem, Steve. And another good uh, sort of uh, museology question here. Um, do you know of any resources we could direct people to um, that discuss the practice of cataloguing LGBTQ plus collections and specifically about um, language and using that in a more inclusive way, uh, given how much, as you've, you've mentioned, uh, language uh, in the community does change? Yeah, language is... Um... Language is really interesting, and it's actually one of my my interests and passions. I'd be I'd be very happy. I, I wouldn't want to start reaming off things with the wrong titles because uh, I don't have the information to hand. But um, I believe that is that question from Tony. That is yes. Yeah, Tony. If you if you would like to get in touch with me, I'm very happy to share with you some. Um, links and resources related to um, gender cataloguing. If you would like to get involved in any kind of cataloguing of LGBTQ material, I can tell you for certain that the Bishopsgate Institute, which is in London, if you are in, 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 in easy reach of London, does have an amazing newspaper clippings collection, which they are in the process of trying to get catalogued. Um, so if you want experience of cataloguing, there are, there, are always, um, there are always opportunities out there somewhere just waiting to be discovered. <laughs> Okay, and I think uh, maybe time for sort of one or two more questions. Let's see. If I'm so happy there are questions, that's great. Oh yes, we've, we've got loads, and we're sorry we can't answer every single one, but we, we yeah, will uh, try to cover the broad subjects and, and uh, follow up with some things. So uh, just carrying on from uh, a question on language, Stephen, uh, John yeah. asks, um, sorry, uh, Gareth asks, uh, John, refer John Chesterman refers to the word queer as how people describe themselves before the word gay was widely used. Yes. Um, did queer get erased from the dialogue and reclaimed later, or has it always remained part of the dialogue since the time of the GLF? Um, I think it was possibly always kind of floating around there. I think that when queer reclaimed its sort of um, radical uh, power was during the 1980s, and that was when um, queer power was a, a, a mantra of in, in the UK, certainly the group Outrage, um, who were a direct action um, gay rights organisation. Um, queer, I, I, the, 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 the way which John was talking about queer there is a very different term in the 1960s pre-gay liberation fronts. And I would guess if you talk to activists from that period, I'm, I'm only just turning 40 this year, but certainly when I... Um, my experience would have been that the word queer was something which was reclaimed. So it was perhaps something that was used against gay people following 1970 and then was reclaimed in the 1980s in order to, um, you know, come together and unite around HIV AIDS activism and indeed just broader social change. I think we do sometimes forget that um, the age of consent was only made equal for everybody in the United Kingdom in 2001 we forget that marriage equality only came through in 2015. Um, so the word queer in the 1980s had a very different, far more radical connotation than it did in the 1960s when John's clip was talking about the word queer. Okay, thanks Stephen. I think we're sort of coming to the end of our time now. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, thanks also to uh, Dana uh, for transcribing for us. I hope that was useful for some of the audience. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone taking part and asking some really brilliant questions. Um, I've shared some of the links Stephen mentions in the chat box. I'll share them again uh, before we finish and I'll also put it on a slide. Uh, a few people asked about recordings. We, we are recording the event and I, I hope that we will issue it as a video at some point, although I, I couldn't tell you exactly when in the future, uh, as obviously the library is putting a lot online at the moment. Uh, do uh, follow British Library on social media uh, to find out future events we're doing online. Uh, there's lots coming up. Um, and again, thanks to everybody. Um, we'll send you a survey um, through email afterwards. Uh, do please fill that in if you can. Um, tell us what you thought of the event, what you'd like to see covered in future by the library, um, as we are doing more of these digital events. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback. Okay, uh, thanks and, and goodbye everyone. And goodbye Stephen as well. Thank you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.